I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And And this this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where we... Read a book and give you our opinions on it. Oh, wait, I have a good one. Okay. We take a a book that was written last year and make it its New Year's self. Only the best version that will dilapidate later. (laughs) Will come unraveled. I feel like, why can't we just tell them what it is? Okay, it's a podcast (laughs) where we read memoirs so that you don't have to. And we give you our opinions. And if you... Don't want those opinions. Pre- please do not proceed. That is not to say we don't appreciate conversation. It's just if you don't want our take, this is where you're going to get our take. This is the only podcast we're on. So if you hate one of us or both of us, listen to a different podcast. It's so easy. It's so easy. And it would be better for you. I think a, everyone's New Year's resolution t- should be if you absolutely hate somebody, you shouldn't actively consume their content. Doesn't that make sense? To me, it does. Claire, yes. speaking of New Year's resolutions and such, mm-hmm. if you were writing about your life, what would you title last year's chapter? Oh my God, I have to think about all of last year. I don't know. I just sprung that on you and me, to be honest. I kind of <laughs> regret it. <laughs> no, take it back. I can only think incrementally in like days at a time. I was going to say, I'm feeling excited for 2023. Last night, me and Ashley did our annual Fancy Fools goals writing with our friend Sophia And we wrote out our goals over a charcuterie board. And I just am excited to see what happens. I'm feeling, you know me, I love a list. I love an agenda. I've never once held to it. And I guess I'll just share one of my small goals for next year. And you guys can hold me accountable. Okay. I want to be able to do a split. Okay. And that's been on my list for about eight years now. But I think this is the year I finally get to do it. Ashley, if you're a celebrity, you could do week or year. No pressure from me. I would actually, I would call this last year a starting point. I feel like I've been setting out to like open myself up to new experiences, especially having like whittled my life down to only the things that I like most, which is incredible. I'm really happy that I spend all day hanging out with you and my job is to make something that I like making with you. But I do think the second half of this year, I had to kind of be like, okay, now that your life is just like going from place to place and doing exactly what you like doing all the time, how do you experience new things? And so... I think that is something I'm very excited for in 2023 to keep experiencing new things. And overall, I am pretty excited for stuff to come. We have really fun stuff coming down the pipe in the CNBC pipeline. We're going to start a book club, a you guys book club. We have live shows. So also, if you don't have tickets for those yet, we are coming to Dallas, Austin, Portland, Seattle, and New York. Yes. LA is sold out. Yeah. We're adding cities constantly (laughs) yes but you know I'm I'm excited we've got experiences coming baby I just want to experience stuff you know I just want to be like experiencing things this last year is when I realized stuff and next year (laughs) I'm gonna experience stuff oh my god that's huge I can't wait speaking of realizing stuff and experiencing stuff I don't know that Alec Baldwin has done either (laughs) (laughs) he's been alive for a few years now yeah a handful but what's happened during those years I don't know that we know I don't know that he could tell us he tried he tried you guys I have to upfront tell you something so we read Alec Baldwin's book nevertheless it came out in 2017 so a little bit old but not that old not that old and a good couple decades into his career this book reads like a precocious seventh grader <laughs> was given someone's IMDB and told to write the world's worst essay it is so over the top and pompous in its writing style and it has almost no interesting stories it has no interesting character development it has it no interesting just insight layers of words upon each other in a way that do not make a sentence someone told Alec Baldwin rule of threes and he was like got it so every sentence should have a three examples of something and then you should have three sentences with three examples and that's how he sets up everything in a way that makes no sense I will say this book to me feels like I mean you guys know Alec Baldwin has seen his fair share of controversy he spends 260 or so pages trying to set the record straight in a way where he's like I know that people think that I'm a bad person because of the things I've done but I'm not a bad person because of the way that I think that I am (laughs) and that's his mantra I also want to say I know that people think that we're so mean and we're so critical blah 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 but actually it's out of respect Alec Baldwin is one of the few memoirists in addition to I think Chriselle from 
selling sunset who straight up is like yeah i wrote this for the money they came to me with this idea to write a memoir i had never thought about writing a memoir before and so i just took the money and did what i did and this is not a good book this is a book that reads like somebody who has never once put thought into writing a memoir and instead just one day was offered a wad of cash and said well this is my job for the next couple of weeks he's as good at writing memoirs as a temp would be at anything <laughs> and and he has a memoir temp he temporarily sat down to write a memoir but i just think that i actually respect good books and people who write good memoirs Memoirs. And I think we always call the Bella Twins, but everyone from the Bella Twins to Danny Trejo to Viola Davis, Molly Shannon, Jeanette McCurdy. I mean, off the podcast, I read Crying in H Mart. I read Somebody's Daughter. There are memoirists who sit down and open up their hearts and their psyches and work hard to deliver a human tale to you. And out of respect for the people who give it their all and try something, I cannot in good conscience sit here and not be critical of someone like Alec Baldwin who writes garbledygook i have to be honest with you i've read now what over 100 memoirs for this podcast i think this one has stuck in my mind the least there's so little in here it is hard to read i think the best you get out of this is like a couple of lines that are shocking not shocking in content sorry shocking in the construction of them and the fact that someone combined those words into a sentence ever <laughs> me and Ashley were like crying laughing going through this book and looking at what we had highlighted I mean it is a ridiculous book but it reminds me of when I was in second grade I wanted to write a 100 page story and I wrote like pages and pages and pages of being like the story this like it was all set up and adjectives and descriptions and I remember my parents wrote the first couple pages and they were so mean to me there was like there's there's no plot Claire they're like there's no plot there's no character development they're like nothing's in here you haven't said anything it's just pages of nothing and in second grade I was so hurt and sad but I'm just like Alec Baldwin needed somebody to say to him there's nothing in here Alec and it's worse than even a Danielle Bernstein or a Molly Good May they're telling a story but like at least they're straightforward saying here's one thing that happened and then here's another thing that happened and they go in sequential order and you know what they're saying Alec Baldwin really considers himself like a great author he thinks he's John Cheever or John Steinbeck or any of those other Johns that dominated the 1900s James Patterson that's not a John <laughs> James is a nickname for John I don't think that with that's the Catholics true. James Patterson is also not the kind of writer I was just describing. <laughs> anyway, he really takes himself seriously. And that makes this book that much worse because you have to fucking wade through bog. This yeah. book is a bog. <laughs> it's a bog where someone told you there might be gold or dinosaur bones and you're just wading and getting muddy. And you're like, oh, it's just frog skeletons, just dead frogs in here. So without further ado, buckle up for nevertheless. Nevertheless, he persisted. Alec Baldwin was born April 3rd, 1958. Oh, my God. He's like the exact same age as my mom. Wow. I think she's birthday? April 29th, 1958. Oh, my God. And so that means he is 62. But he wrote this book in 2017 when he was 57. Good math. Thank you. He opens with a preface where he discusses. He really waffles in this book with whether or not he wants to be famous Mm -hmm. like whether or not he regrets living a public life I mean one of the things he wanted I think was to be notable I think he wanted to be rich he knows he wanted to be rich but I think he also well he wanted to be rich and he wanted to be powerful yes and often being rich and powerful makes you a bit notable yes he talks about the other jobs that he's imagined he would have a lot of them are nonsense I think one that's worth pointing out is he said a job that he'd imagined having is to be the warden of a prison because I thought that that was a powerful way to reach some of the most forgotten people what does he think prison wardens do benevolent leaders wait till he finds out about <laughs> for-profit prison the reason this is such a stupid thought is because he goes on and on in this book about his understanding and knowledge over politics and justice and justice lifelong pursuit of justice for all he literally hates classism and racism so it's very interesting that he's like i would love to be in charge of prisons <laughs> but other jobs are he wanted to open a stationary store maybe he wanted to sell antiques maybe he wants to be the warden maybe he wants to be an art gallery guy maybe he'll become a lawyer and prosecute those who abuse power, making the bad guys tremble at the sound of my name. Who does he think are the bad guys? <laughs> he also says, I'd help those who had done wrong and who were actually caught and put away by those of us who, by God's grace, were neither caught nor punished. Alec, I believe you've been caught. <laughs> I also believe that later in this book, you call Woody Allen your mentor. He says, I wish I had the aplomb and grace that Woody Allen has. Oh, Jesus Christ. 
So then he comes around and says, I wrote this book because they pay me to do it, which is why I've done everything in my life. My whole life, all I've ever done is try to do things that'll get me paid. But he also talks about how his core values are humility, service, and loyalty. So I guess they're just at odds with each other. Yeah, he's humiliated that he wasn't always getting paid. (laughs) He talks about how he has lived a pretty treacherous life in the public. I've endured and invited a level of scrutiny that has pushed me to the brink of self-destruction. Or simply a self-imposed anonymity. Where was that? (laughs) How many times could you have been pushed to the brink of self-imposed anonymity that for 40 years you've kept saying, not this time? I dreamed of doing some kind of work that would make a difference in the lives of the people I cared about. I mean, you still have the opportunity to do that. I actually will say throughout this book, one of the only things I will give him credit for acknowledging is the way he chose a public life. He talks about his pursuit of fame a little bit and acknowledges that it's his fault. I mean, we talk about this all the time. I think that there are actors who can choose to have like mostly private lives, but there are things you gain from being a public celebrity. Like you get more roles by being a bankable name and choosing that though, you lose anonymity. Then the book starts with chapter one and right away, you know what garbledy gook this is going to (laughs) be. When I tell you it's four pages of description and he won't tell you what he's describing, which as a reader is quite unendurable. It is incredibly hard to start in a book and have no idea what's going on for no other reason. Especially because what he's describing, he is describing a person, but at many points it's unclear that he's talking about a person. (laughs) The woman lying next to me was a large woman. I will always remember her that way. Only five feet seven, she seemed taller. Her forearms were like blades broad and flat and packed with rippling tendons from endlessly carrying around children and groceries and whatnot. She was strong and had fast hands, gunfighter fast. When she struck you, her right arm sprang towards you. Snap. Like Navratilova's backhand. That, okay, so that's one paragraph. There's 25 of these paragraphs. And then he's describing the house and the bed and the dresser and everything's breaking down and the paint's coming off. Then he goes back to describing her in a mean way. The woman, believing that it held magical weight loss potential, drank rivers of tab. If slimming was her goal, it was to no effect. Each successive choice to have six kids in 11 years left her body racked. From the bottom of her ribcage to the top of her pelvis, any muscular fiber was gone. When she coughed or laughed, her stomach beneath her sheer bedclothes seemed to ripple like water. Why is he saying this? So he's describing his mother. (laughs) Of course. He's nine years old in this situation. He's like, she never went outside. Why didn't she want to see daylight? Why didn't she want to go for a walk? I would never understand. She was raising six fucking children. Also, he's acting like she was just always sitting there in bed. She was taking a nap in this specific memory. And then the rest of the time she was raising six children. (laughs) She's doing constant laundry. She's making dinner. She's cleaning the house. And he never thinks she does good enough. He talks so much about how his life is bad because his house is never clean enough because his clothes are never clean as often as the other kids' clothes are cleaned. They never have good enough dinners. He's so resentful of the lack of success his mom has as a homemaker. (laughs) I was nine years old and addicted to solitude. (laughs) Anyway, so then he goes on to describe his life. If you went out the back door of our house and looked west, there was a block of middle class South Shore, Long Island, white flight homes. So he's like, we lived in a mostly middle and upper middle class neighborhood, except for them. They were poor. And as me and Ashley were noticing, isn't it interesting that the way America is zoned is that everyone in the whole world is an upper middle class person, except for the one shack that exists in every Long Island town. Every neighborhood has one poor family and someone from that poor family becomes famous (laughs) and writes a book about being the only poor kid in town there's one poor family per town in this country and in this town it was the baldwins he talks about their activities how there was nothing to do he would stay up late and watch tv he would like trick his parents to letting him watch movies and he's like but you had to pay attention when you watch movies because you couldn't rewind and it's like yeah okay i've seen movies nothing he says makes any sense he talks about being his father's favorite so he's the second of six first was his older sister then him and he says because of this he was his dad's favorite but he also talks about even from a young age waiting up late for his dad to come home and after waiting all night for his dad to come into the door his dad won't even speak to him (laughs) he's like but we had our thing he'd let me watch a movie with him until he fell asleep I'm like, yeah, that does sound like love. He's like, I have the best dad in the world. His dad was a high school teacher, and he had met his mother, gone to one year of law school. Her mother's dad was paying for his law school education, and because of pride, he dropped out after one year and became a high school teacher. And then again, because of pride, he never got promoted. He says the school system in Long Island was fucked up, and the guy who ran it was like a shitty person, and so his dad refused to kiss ass, and because of that, he never made a lot of money. He also refused to get summer jobs, but it was because he was noble. Yeah, he had a lot of personal integrity. Unlike his lazy bitch mom, he just had wriggly body. (laughs) 
a lot of the teachers in town would have second jobs because teaching does not pay a fuck ton of money. And he was like, yeah, but my dad wouldn't do that. So we just didn't have money growing up. Oh, another weird thing about his childhood. For a while, his cousins came to live with him. And he had double first cousins because his dad and mom's brother and sister married each other. So like two brothers married two sisters. But then one of the brothers ditched. Uh, Yeah, one of the brothers ran away. It was a whole thing. And I'm just like, what are you talking about, double first cousins? His dad, he says, around the age of 40, became very depressed. It seems like they were overrun with kids. Their money was always tight. At one point, they were living in two bedrooms. And they moved to a bigger house that was more run down. And just things were always hard. His parents didn't get along. He says they were like six pieces of driftwood floating aimlessly through life without a clear passion or purpose. And it's like, well, yeah, you were eight. Yeah, you're not supposed to have like a clear passion or purpose. My clear passion when I was eight years old was to like become a veterinarian, I think, or a pop star. I used to get into fights with my mom all the time because she'd always be like, what do you like to do? And I'd be like, hang out with my friends. And she's like, that's not a thing. And I'm like, I don't know. I can't believe you were constantly going on first dates with your mom. (laughs) What are your hobbies? I don't know. (laughs) She really wanted me to have like a talent or a skill. Well, joke's on you. Look what I do for a job now. I (laughs) hang out with my friends. I told you that was my passion. (laughs) So he's talking about getting a clearer picture of who his dad is. He says years later, talking to a therapist, he asked me to examine the period from the fall of 1967 to the fall of 1968. In one year, your father turned 40. And with that came all of the self appraisal about what he had and had not achieved. As a progressive, he watched Martin Luther King and RFK get killed. Next, his political nemesis, Richard Nixon, rises from the dead and is elected president. His mother is killed in a horrible freak accident. I saw my dad in the clear light, one that explained why up until his death in 1983, at the age of only 55, my father was never the same again. I'm sorry. I, okay, I feel bad. So his, Alec Baldwin's grandma died tripping down hospital steps and like cracking her skull and then she passed away so that is a horrible freak accident and it was on the way to the hospital to visit his dad who had just had a huge heart attack or something so yes that sucks but these other three things <laughs> being like listen your dad your dad is the only man in America who had to watch his close friends <laughs> Martin <laughs> Luther King and JFK got shot and then his personal enemy his rival from the rival high school Richard Nixon <laughs> got elected I'm sorry. I like cannot That's sit too in- much for one man to go through. Thank God the whole country didn't all experience that exact same thing. I mean, yes. Once again, having your mom die in a freak accident, no good. But that seems to be the cherry on top. That seems to be the cherry on top of his other great traumas that were his alone to bear. I can't get over his political nemesis. Richard Nixon <laughs> rises from the dead and is elected. Pers- Do you think Richard Nixon knows about Alec Baldwin's dad, also named Alec Baldwin? Yeah, Alec Baldwin, growing up, was called Xander. But you didn't know that. Now you do. It explains so much. I feel like you never met a Xander that didn't talk like this. <laughs> so him and his siblings, they felt alone. At one point, his brother finds a dead squirrel and looks up at Alec Baldwin and says, will you help me bury it? As he looked at me, I thought, he is that squirrel. So am I. And all we have today is the hope that we don't get crushed by something. We have nothing. And everything <laughs> seems so fragile. <laughs> Oh God. This is sorry, this is the line. We were just six pieces of driftwood just bobbing through our neighborhood without a current to carry us in any particular direction. Passing time, trying to pass our classes, avoiding trouble, courting trouble, scoring points, telling jokes, drinking, smoking, always mindful of how little we had. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like being 13, dude. I don't know. <laughs> So then he starts washing cars to earn money and he starts to realize how great it is to have money. He eventually starts mowing lawns. And as he starts to earn more money doing just neighborhood tasks, he does notice what it is like to be the person in his family with money. His mom is constantly asking him for money. He like owes taxes to his dad. It is being rich is very important to him. He wants to be in some serious American John Steinbeck novel. So he says stuff like, Long before the advent of medical marijuana, they smoked it like it was medicine. They smoked pot like they were on the U.S. Olympic pot smoking team. I wondered what these youths might have achieved if they had put as much energy into other more constructive activities as they did into smoking pot. They lived on a kind of academic sideline. Dude, I, I mean, don't, there's a chance that those kids went on to do something with their lives. I think lives. those white teenagers who were smoking pot in high school, I don't think that ended it for them. I think they ended up okay. <laughs> I think if we called all of them, they're probably all in finance right now. <laughs> 
My father, who had moved to the suburbs to give his kids a better life, seemed to sink lower under the gathering evidence that white flight suburbia had its own set of problems. As a public high school teacher, he was exposed to a parade of troubled kids who were being pulled under by drugs and petty crime. Not petty crime! (laughs) (laughs) Were they stealing mascara from CVS? And then he graduates. He says, in one of his more nonsense, this is one, this is the one that really got to me. He goes, and then, like a ball game called on account of rain, high school was suddenly over. <laughs> that is not, That's high not how high school ends. I'm sorry, but if you have a child that is born today, text me and I will give you within a two-week range when high school will probably end for that kid. You know exactly when high school is going to end. It's obvious did his high school end randomly like in a january like why is he like it was called out of nowhere we didn't get to finish weather you cannot predict no one can predict it they hire people from all over the world to try and predict weather and the only one who can do it is santa but (laughs) i I won't engage with what you're saying right now i i don't like it when you act like there's no science but i do agree with you that we know when high school ends and it ends when it's supposed to unless i guess you were in covid unless you were in covid unless like i don't know there are certain things that maybe maybe it ends a six months early for you maybe it ends a year late like there are situations but to say that it was like a ball game called like I mean I will say if your high school ends earlier or later than expected you have a good runway to know that that's gonna happen it's never just like hey hey wake up today's your last day (laughs) you're just in the middle of English one Wednesday and they're like hey the brain it's over I just got the call high school this is it wrap it up (laughs) <laughs> Go on. We skipped my favorite line, which is about how he didn't have a lot of luck with the ladies back in the day. He coveted a lot of girlfriends. But it doesn't <laughs> sound like he closed on. And part of that was because he was skinny. But part of that was because everyone else was so rich. And he says, getting laid, I suppose, would have been easier if someone, anyone, had folded the laundry and cleaned the kitchen after baking a pile of chocolate chip cookies for my friends before we headed out on my boat. But that wasn't the situation. And so he blames his mom for not keeping their house tidy enough for why he wasn't getting laid. And I'm like, what do you think is (laughs) happening in American homes? Do you think mothers across the country are inviting teenage girls over and being like, what could I bake for you that would get you to suck my son's dick? (laughs) Can I take you on a boat? Do you know what goes great with my son's cum? Cookies. <laughs> Don't worry about the mess. I'll do laundry later. Just get up there, sweetheart, and give it your best show. <laughs> Spit wherever you want because I'll do the laundry for you. <laughs> we have Tide Pods. <laughs> I like that's not what was stopping you from getting laid. Trust me, of all the times I had sex, my mom was never once a factor. <laughs> Not directly, anyway. <laughs> I guess in the sense that I was born of her. <laughs> That's true. All moms facilitate teenage banging in that way. In the, in the existential sense. <laughs> but never once did my boyfriend come over and she was like, how'd you do up there, champ? You deserve cookies? <laughs> <laughs> Would a boat sweeten the deal? <laughs> I know my daughter's pussy sucks, but what if I tell you we have a boat? <laughs> Would you fuck her then? <laughs> I bet my mom's listening right now. I'm about to kill herself. This is really brutal for her. <laughs> when you said my daughter's P word, <laughs> I'm not going to say it because I don't want to drive your mom <laughs> further off a slope. <laughs> and dad, they both listen. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so then it was because of high school getting called like a ball game. It was time for college. And he says, my grades were good, but not what they might have been if I, what, worked harder, lived under different circumstances. I mean, what do you want, Alec? You went to a good college. Like, he went to a decent school. We know now that he is very rich and successful. So why is he sitting here being like, if only I'd been born of different circumstances, maybe I would have gotten a slightly better education, which would have led me to where else? Like, where where more would you have gone? I don't know, because he also went to GW and then NYU. So it's not like he didn't get to go to college. And also, I'm like, I don't know, which college was going to make you a better Jack Lemon? What have you done? I'm sorry. No, Jack Donaghy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. right. No, it's ridiculous. But my favorite thing about Alec Baldwin is the way he uses the word opportunity. Yeah. Opportunity to him is something that could have ever happened in any version of any universe. (laughs) And if it doesn't happen, then it was a missed opportunity in the sense that I guess like being a princess would have been a great opportunity for me. And it's too bad that didn't pan out. So his dad wanted him to go to Columbia. And apparently he had a friend who had a friend who thought they could get Alec Baldwin on the Columbia football team, even though Alec Baldwin was bad at football and quit the team like three times throughout high school. He was constantly just walking off the field and going home. And his dad would be like, please go back. And so he would try again for his dad. And he'd be like, I, I hate it here. So believe it or not, that was not actually D1 level playing. So not only did he not make it onto the football team, but also his grades weren't good enough. 
Columbia made few, if any, allowances for athletes. You were either competitive academically or not. My father tried to lessen the blow by telling me that the end of the Vietnam War in August of 1975 meant a flood of applicants and thus more competitive field, but I nonetheless was frustrated and sad that a great opportunity had disappeared. There was no opportunity there What for opportunity? You. I you can't just believe didn't get like, in. <laughs> I was so sad that the war had ended because it meant that more people were trying to go to college. Well, then he's like, I thought I was going to join the Air Force next, but my dad said I probably wouldn't get to be a pilot. Once again, the end of the war cast its shadow. Nobody has been fucked over harder by the end of the <laughs> Vietnam War than Alec Baldwin. If only those boys boys just kept going out there to get gunned down and die do the veterans that have come home and been neglected by the government do they know how good they had it do the people in vietnam who were killed needlessly or do they ever stop and think like wow if only a couple more of us had died maybe alec baldwin could have gone to his dream college and then what gone on to success and a hot young wife so he slums it to gw because he couldn't get into columbia or become a pilot Back then, GW was a school where many students went to make first-year grades that enabled them to transfer to their first-choice school, Stanford or Harvard or the University of Chicago. But regardless of GW's lack of status in the 70s, a college campus can be a social equalizer, and it provided me with an opportunity for great reinvention. So he has a little bit of an easier time because no one has a mom in their dorm baking cookies for the people <laughs> who fuck them. <laughs> He's like, there's no social status in college. And then later goes on to be like, everybody was going to fancy restaurants and I didn't understand anything. Nothing he ever says is consistent. It's both I was my dad's favorite and he also never once spoke to me. I think he just like keeps on making up stories in his head and forgets where he started. One of my favorite lines though is in college, he tries to get into student government. He doesn't. He says, it's been said that politics is show business for less attractive people and the offices of the GW Student Association for the most part bore that out. They wouldn't let me join them, but it's fine because they were uggos anyway. Okay, there's like a weird aside about football again, and he talks about how he didn't really understand football because he says, the idea that you tried to destroy some opponent for a couple of hours and afterwards hugged him seemed odd to me. That's what sports is. A lot of this book is Alec Baldwin saying that he's never experienced anger. That's like a literal quote from this book. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I think you've punched many a paparazzi. <laughs> so he goes to GW. He leaves. He ends up at going to NYU, but Wait, not no, before. No, before. Can I tell you what happens at GW? Another thing? Sure. He falls in love for the first time. Oh, yeah. This is an important. And I was prepared for, you know, a life-altering love. No. Instead, he, like, sees a girl crying on the ground because her on-again, off-again boyfriend broke up with her. And he was like, wow, she is hot. I love her. And they went on a couple of dates, and that was it. And he's like, she was my first love. And it's like. I don't think that that's what love is. I don't want to minimize your experience, but I don't think she was. I have to tell you, Alec Baldwin claims he's fallen in love 1,000 times. A lot of this book is him being like, am I gay? I don't know. <laughs> Most of this book is him being like, and then I met this man. He was an incredible actor, and it was the first time I truly fell in love. He's like, sure, I didn't have sex with him. I had sex with girls that I didn't care about, but him... I looked at him and he was handsome and he was charismatic and he taught me everything I wanted to know. And I would go on these weekend romances where we would just sit and talk and laugh for hours. And then I would fuck a girl I don't care about and he would watch. <laughs> <laughs> so then he transfers to NYU because he runs for class president at GW and he does not get elected. And this follows him to this day. He is upset about not being... Anyway, we'll come back to it because it comes up again later. But he... In the sadness because of a breakup, because of not being elected class president, he goes to visit his friend at NYU and he says, based solely on Sherry's playful provocation, I auditioned for the theater program at NYU. Is that how auditioning works? Can you just randomly be there one weekend and say like, hey, you guys available for a quick audition? Is that it? He just does off the cuff some monologue that he found and he gets in, I guess. And that summer before he goes up, he has a job in D.C., and I just think it's important to share because he gets to take over the whole pizza parlor more or less because the owner is in great despair over the death of his wife. And he says, by sensing and responding to his grief, I realized that I had an above average empathy for other people's feelings, likely due to growing up with my mother. I could understand other people, get inside them better than most. I began to think that maybe this acting idea wasn't such a bad decision after all. Hey, I just want to let you know, if you're listening to this and this ever occurred to you that someone who just lost their wife might be sad, you have above average empathy and could be a great actor. <laughs> I want to tell you something else. If you know someone who just lost their wife and it doesn't occur to you that that person might be sad, please excuse yourself. <laughs> his clues were that the owner of the pizzeria just sat in the back in his office and cried all day. And Alec Baldwin was like, there's an emotion here and I can't put my finger on exactly what it is. Is it mad? No. Wait. Jealous? Confused? <laughs> Sneezy? <laughs> Grumpy? Doc? <laughs> What's this man feeling? It'd be many years of acting with Lee Stroudsburg before he put his finger on the nose. Sad. 
it. <laughs> okay. So then he like kind of shits on NYU's acting program, but he likes acting overall, I think. I this know. is very confusing. What he likes is actors. So he, unlike a Busy Phillips, a Viola Davis, a Molly Shannon, he never talks about craft. He never talks about studying. He never talks about like the love of being coming another person but he has an obsession with like the greats he loves a marlon brando he loves a who else is pretty famous out there uh robert de niro yeah he loves a robert de niro he loves a natasha redgrave like he loves golden era classical hollywood icon yes and he imagines he should have been one of them he at one point romanticizes being born earlier surviving world war ii and becoming a golden age of hollywood actor to him the worst thing that's ever happened was the end of a war <laughs> he thinks we should all be at war all the time and to him i say alec baldwin there's wars out there we if you want to be a war. part of a war so badly annie get your gun <laughs> you know we'll meet we'll meet up in the ukraine i don't know so how does he break into acting you may be wondering when does it all happen for him does he head out to la and you know cut his teeth doing the grind of course not in a moment that would become a pattern in my career He's working at the New York Sports Club at the desk, and this woman goes, my friend is casting a soap opera, and you seem like what she's looking for. I didn't bother to ask exactly what that was. I just wanted to work. The role was on a daytime soap opera called The Doctors. So he just, like, goes over and signs the contract and has two years. So that's how he did it. He says he learned acting through being on this soap. He gives almost no credit to being at NYU. He says, O'Brien would tell me that acting is about making the audience believe in what I'm saying. I mean... I could have told you that. I don't think he knows what acting is. He goes, a few months have passed. I was given more to do. The producers wanted me to play a self-involved, semi-ruthless, amoral cad. It didn't matter if I possessed the personal character of Abraham Lincoln or John Glenn. The audience liked characters that were bad. That's what the producers wanted me to be. I mean, that's what the role is. Just play the fucking role, Alec. He later goes on to be like, the craziest thing about acting is they'll make you play anybody, even if it's not who you are. And then some people think that is who you are, but you're just acting and they don't really. And I'm like, what do you think acting is, Alec? Did you think it was going out there and showing people who you really are? It's literally the opposite. <laughs> some choose to go to the gym every day, dye their hair, whiten their teeth, and hope they get lucky enough to play some uncomplicated leading man or superhero. But if you learn how to act any role, the options get better. That hit me hard about six months into the job. What? I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> six months into your first professional gig acting every day, it suddenly occurred to you that if you could act like more people, you could get more role. Like, what are you saying to me, Alex? So this O'Brien is, he loves O'Brien. He falls in love with him non-sexually, of course. O'Brien's in love with him back sexually, however. Sexually, however, and teaches him everything he needs to know about acting. A lot of this book is how many gay guys have hit on Alec Baldwin. <laughs> then he meets his agent, Bloom, Mike Bloom, at their first meeting Mike Bloom kisses him and then Alec Baldwin says you're my friend so I'm gonna let that go but if you ever do that again I'm gonna break every bone in your body he nodded as if to say got it and then we drove back to New York he never made a move on me again and our real friendship was born I have to interrupt this program to bring this line I don't know what he, they're even talking about here but he just goes many years later my wife Hilaria once said to me as a means of underscoring some forgetfulness on my part when I'm not with you I still exist the comment reminded me of how wrapped up in my own concerns I was during this period I saw my siblings infrequently, something I look back on with a lot of regret. I don't think it's a good sign that your wife, <laughs> your wife has to be like, hey, just when, when we're not in the same room, I still am a person. You know, I don't only exist in relation to you, right? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm still a person when you can't see me. At one point, around the fall of 1981, my father moved out. As always, I learned about it from my sister, Beth. Everyone was stunned. He moves into some girl who used to be a student's house and that does not get impact. She, he's just like the animosity that's triggered within my family was epic. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. So <laughs> anyway, so then his contract on the doctors is up and his agent, Michael Bloom tells him to move to Los Angeles around that same time. His dad is diagnosed with cancer and everyone says, you know what? He'll beat it. Go to LA. My mother lied to me. My sister, Beth lied to me. They all told me he had a very good chance of beating it. So he drives across the country to L.A. in 1983. Meanwhile, Beth ferried my dad to work on whatever days he wasn't at Sloan Kettering and later Mount Sinai. So now out in L.A., he says, I missed my family, the simplicity of being myself, of being accepted, even loved simply for who I was. Up until this point, we have heard nothing except for the fact that his family like left him adrift. We get like one sentence from each of a 100 stories compiled into one book. He goes out to L.A. He does a whole chapter on this week-long road trip they took and I don't know if anybody out there is genuinely interested where his him and his friend Tuck stopped along the way to get from Long Island 
to LA and it was all just Tux's friends, then you can read this book. But I have to tell you, it was truly unriveting. <laughs> it was a slog. So he gets out to LA and he's getting work right away. He does very well. I met Jean Guest, the mother of director Christopher Guest and the head of casting at CBS. Jean was a kind, intelligent woman who seemed to be my corner in those early days. Anybody who was ever rooting for him for no reason was in his corner. Another producer was Jerry Abrams, father of the prolific J.J. Abrams. He put him in a pilot. He keeps just getting cast in things no problem. And so after he films one of these first pilots, he goes back to New York and finds out that my dad had only weeks to live. Then his dad passes away. After my father's death, my relationship with my mother hit an all-time low. As I look back, I attribute this to her fear and economic insecurity as a widow. However, we entered a period where I was more of an ex-husband than a son. That's a lot to unpack. So he starts to appreciate his family a little bit more now that his dad is dead and he's spending more time with them. He says, perhaps I created this bogus myth that I had crossed some ocean to make my fortune by going to Los Angeles. The truth is I was simply uninterested in going home back to a place that required me to explain who I had become. So he sticks around for a couple of weeks and then he gets out of there. And he says, my sister Jane was just a kid who fell between the cracks of my reality, which was sad because she was and is such a bright person and is engaged by learning in the same way that I was. Okay. I don't know that he was engaged by learning. It seems like he didn't get good grades. And then also, I think just like as an adult in your late 50s to be looking at what happened of your sister, who's probably similar early 50s, late 40s, and be like, it's crazy how her life ended up. She also could have been a good student when she was 15 or something. Like his obsession with what kind of grades you got and how that dictated your life. It's so crazy. I feel like the minute you leave college, I never think about my GPA again. I would never look at anybody and be like, oh, but how'd you do in bio? Especially because he is... Very successful. Yeah, he's the proof. <laughs> we also almost never hear about his brothers in this book. There's one throwaway line that he's like, I was living with Steven at the time who was shooting some TV show, but they do not come up ever. At all. I was wondering if he's ever met Haley Baldwin Bieber. I think so. I think if you were like, do you know Haley? He would, he would have been like, Hilaria. She goes by Hilaria. <laughs> so then he moves back out to LA. And at this point, he's addicted to alcohol and cocaine. He loves cocaine. He gets engaged to some girl. They're in and out within nine months tale is all the time but he's like we went out to brunch with our family and even her grandpa's like what the hell is wrong with you why do you keep going to the bathroom there's something <laughs> up then he spends like four pages explaining this really intense murder that they were turning into a movie he was like before oj this was the murder in town and they wanted me to be in it and then he also gets offered a role in knots landing and he takes the role in knots landing so i'm like why did you spend fucking five pages explaining this murder to me I also had that question. There were so many red herrings where I was like, why did we have to go down that road of describing a TV movie from the 80s that you were not in? So now he's on Knott's Landing and his star is starting to rise. He decides to get a publicist and someone from the show is like, Alec, don't get a publicist. Let the work speak for itself. How I wished over the years that I had taken her advice. And so this is the part where he kind of admits to courting the media and trying to like turn himself into a celebrity, which obviously he's done. Obviously, it worked. And I think that it's like one of the reflective points where he's like, I don't know that I needed to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's very interesting because I don't know that we've ever read a memoir from someone who is like, I don't know if I wanted to be famous. Then we get this 10 page story about a time that he did a lot of cocaine once and he was sitting in a hotel room and he kept ordering champagne from room service. And it, he did so much cocaine that he was neither high, couldn't get sober, went to a hospital. They knocked him out for 24 hours and then he went back to work. And that's the story. It's the least interesting story in the world. Yeah. That wasn't his rock bottom, though. He gets really fucked up with a friend who later dies. And, like, that's what gets him sober. So then he gets sober and, and he, like, has a little ode to AA. And he's like, you know, I've done fucked up shit sober. But think about the more fucked up shit that I would have done if I kept doing drugs and drinking. He also is like, I've never done the work that they say you should do. But I, I do stay off drugs and alcohol. And you're like, yeah. That's a problem. Maybe let's do some, some internal looking. He talks about during this time, his relationships were all kind of nonsense. He said he wasn't giving women anything. He was like putting his career first in all circumstances, like in his personal relationships with both women and family. He's on this ensemble show, which is one of the hits on primetime TV, which is a huge deal, especially in the 80s when there's only like six channels. And he's talking about how he doesn't want to do it forever. And he goes, I didn't want a career like that of my castmate, Ted Shackelford, where you come in week after week and do the same thing every day. I mean, for you to be 25 years old, having had nothing but success handed to you and already be like, ugh, but I had to get out of this easy the paycheck. Monotony. <laughs> I, the worst thing that could happen would be a long time consistent working actor like my senior who's on this project with me. So then he goes back to New York for a week and he's like, no, I have to move back here. He says the 
Dude, this is crazy. He's walking around and he goes, that morning I thought as some elderly folks shuffled by, New York's got so many old people. A moment later, New York's got so many fat people. And then I never realized how black New York is. As I noticed, at least a third of those on the street were African-American. New York is so old and fat and black, I thought. Coming home from L.A., the land of the trim, youth-obsessed, and racially polarized, made me realize that I'd been away for far too long. Once I was in my right mind, New York just seemed like the perfect fit. So he moves back to New York in 1986. Okay. I, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> So then he gets his first Broadway show, and this is when he gets into theater. He thinks theater is the highest form of art that's ever existed. And he really has a lot of respect for them, but reading this book, it's just name after name after name, and he doesn't add much else. So if you don't know who these people are, it's hard to follow because it just doesn't matter that much. He doesn't make anybody seem important. Do you know what I mean? He rests on the weight of the names themselves and does not do any work as a writer. So if you don't know what these names mean, it's a meaningless page after page after page and he's not just talking about actors he's talking about the producers he's talking about the set designers he's talking about the writers so it's just like all of these proper nouns that you're like like piles of words it's really hard to get through and you're just waiting for what the point is and it tends to just be lists of like and then I was in this play with this person and that person and this person who had also been in a play with this person who had also starred in this movie who sucked but they got a second chance because their daughter and I'm just like why do we care? Who cares? Right. So then the next big important thing, so he gets his Broadway experience and then that leads to, or I don't know if it leads to, but at, a, at some point then he does a movie called Hunt, which is a film adaptation of, and he plays the main character, Jack Ryan, and it's a huge deal, a huge starring blockbuster role for him. And he thinks that this is going to like skyrocket him into the stratosphere of Bruce Willis. Because it is a series. Yes. However... Upon the second installment of this series, it seems that he gets into a little bit of a tiff with the production. And his claim is that all he asked, like an innocent angel, was for his schedule. All he wanted to know was, how long would I be shooting for? And he had one or two little ideas about how much his character would even be featured in the film. Somehow it seems like his character had been scaled back, and he had some idea for an opening scene where his character is on the front page of every newspaper and everybody's saluting him and singing, literally singing the national anthem at him in a bar. And it turns out they are planning to replace his character. And he's like, so they didn't want any ideas from me, an actor who was playing a character that was about to get cut. And he's acting like it's so fucked up and random and weird that he got cut from this film and that they went with Harrison Ford instead. But a quick Google search that I did not dive too far into says that it turns out the production company has their own side of the story. And it wasn't just poor little baby Alec Baldwin innocently and reasonably said, what would the schedule look like? He like tries so hard not to go on a rant about how much he hates Harrison Ford, but he goes, Ford is one of the most successful stars in movie history. He has abundant fame, wealth, and the adulation of an adoring public and everyone in the town. One thing he does not have is an Oscar, which must frustrate if not burden him. After his long career, Ford's lack of any serious accolades for his acting is somewhat odd. In review of the LA Weekly performance, In the Scott Turner drama, Presumed Innocent, the critic wrote, watch Ford's acting go from beige to taupe. He certainly has had every advantage. He's worked with the best directors. One would assume that his projects have budgets for the best writers, designers, craftspeople, shooting schedules, and casting. They have lots of money for marketing and ad campaigns during award season. Every single asset that Hollywood can bring to bear is rolled out on behalf of his films. And yet, Ford is Oscar-wise (laughs) empty-handed. Okay. (laughs) How big are those hands? Ford, in person, is a little man, short, (laughs) scrawny, and wiry, whose soft voice sounds as if it's coming from behind a door. He also goes on to say, I learned that when you're not Harrison Ford, simply asking for the schedule might be overplaying your hand. Eventually, Patriot Games, which is the second movie, eventually Patriot Games was made with Ford in the lead role of Jack Ryan, and it made less money than Hunt. Wait, wait, (laughs) just like point blank, it made less money? When adjusted for inflation. (laughs) This is like four pages of him going on and on about how even though Harrison Ford is like, I mean, people think great things of him and people give him a lot of opportunities. But when you really look at what he's done, when you look at who he is, isn't he kind of pathetic? Here's a question. Does Alec Baldwin have an Oscar? Does he? I mean, it didn't come up in this book and I can't imagine he would have left that out. But let's double check. He was nominated. He lost, though. So he and Harrison Ford, I think, have the same number of Oscars. (laughs) So in the meantime, he's doing other movies. He briefly mentions Beetlejuice and names every person he started it with except for Gina Davis, which I find odd. He also sees Kim Basinger. Is it Basinger or Basinger? Or is it Basinger? 
Bass. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep saying Basinger. What if we call her Kimmy B? I'm going to call her Kimmy B. And if anyone takes offense to that, don't tell me. Uh, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> we, have, we have bigger fish to fry. The first time he ever sees Kimmy B is when he goes to see Batman, whose ubiquitous billboards actually suggested an interesting movie. Okay. Why are you mad at a movie from 40 years ago, dude? <laughs> I don't. I just feel like if a movie sucked 40 years ago, maybe in your memoir, you don't give it space. At a late afternoon screening, my friend and I were perhaps the only two adults not accompanying a child. Well, then maybe this movie wasn't for you. <laughs> I can't believe he went to see Coco Mel and he was like, this fucking sucked. <laughs> <laughs> the kids in the theater perked up over the bat suit and the Batmobile. When Kim came on screen, they frowned and wanted to get back to the action. I, on the other hand, turned to my friend and said, she's a very beautiful woman. I have heard that notoriously boys, teen and preteen boys, are not turned on by women. <laughs> I've heard that like... Halle Berry as Catwoman, Catherine Zeta-Jones and whatever nonsense she was like. I've Alicia heard these, Silverstone as Batgirl. Like I've heard none of this has ever done anything for a, a teenage boy. Yeah. A red blooded American child. Alec Baldwin was the only person on earth who saw Kim basing Kimmy B <laughs> and thought she's hot. Him and I are very similar in that we both have that unique ability to look at a very, very beautiful woman and go. Is there something here? <laughs> Especially when she's already when been she's cast. Already famous. <laughs> when she's already famously beautiful. <laughs> I go, wait a minute. That face. Are you guys feeling something? Tell my mom to get the oven preheated. <laughs> anyway. We've got some cookies to bake. <laughs> Kimmy B, you like a cookie? So then he is in another play and it's very well received and they're about to make it into a movie and he is offered the same role in the movie. But then he's offered another movie called The Marrying Man and he decides to take that instead because the paycheck is way bigger. And he says that is his top regret in life is taking The Marrying Man. It was a devastating mistake and without a shred of doubt, the single decision I made that changed my career and my life forever. Can I tell you something? I, I don't actually believe. don't believe that. I don't believe that at Much all. Much like what we said about Jennifer Grey, I don't believe that if you have a four decade plus career where you're constantly given opportunities both in the big screen, on indie films, and in TV. On the stage. I do not think one bad choice of a movie could tank your career when you had another 30 choices to pick a good movie. Yeah. And also when you came out pretty successful despite it all. Nevertheless. I mean, it's very Selma Blair to me in that because he wasn't Bruce Willis, he thinks he failed. Like he's not Bruce Willis, he's not Tom Cruise. And so he's like, I could have done so much more. And it's like, you did a lot. You are very successful. Yeah. It, it reminds me of Jennifer Grey when she was like, like, if it hadn't been for that one nose job and the fact that I never showed up to auditions and the fact that I didn't like acting and the fact that I didn't keep trying and the fact that I, like, mostly was just hanging out with Johnny Depp and the fact that I... But unlike Jennifer Grey, he actually did have a very successful career. No, that's true. Then he does a movie with Kim Kimmy B. That's where they meet for real. And they get together and together are, like, a dynamic duo of train wreck I think but he says it was all Kim he's like on this movie everyone thought that Kim was the most difficult bitch alive and I defended her he says during this film some premiere hit piece came out so they were having a hard time with Disney and he completely blames it on Kim and it's one of those things where he's like you know we got to the set and the script was pretty dated and sexist and Kim made a big stink about how it shouldn't be sexist anymore and Disney hated that about her Anyway, then Disney ran this hit piece on both of us and quote, the piece made us look like two spoiled, ridiculous children. I can only begin to imagine what was being said off the record to the media. An important die was cast during that film as I began to think that defending Kim from any and all trouble was becoming my job. The, the piece was against both of you. Yeah. And he's like, well, you know me, everyone hated Kim, but because I was her boyfriend and a hero, I had to stand up for her. Meanwhile, on the next page, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was at that point, the head of the Disney studios calls him in is basically like, listen, buddy, you're two actors. We could get the guy from down the street to come fucking do your job we represent the film and if you can't let the film do its job then like we have a problem with you and I'm just sitting here wondering if Kim was the problem why did Alec get called to the office he goes on this like weird side rant about how defending Kim was like a real hit to his career and he, how he envies Tom Cruise and he's like maybe there is something to Scientology because it like allows you to go for it without apology keeping your focus on yourself and your goals and not like family or other people so then his mom is diagnosed with breast cancer. The way he talks about it is just so weird. He goes, a lifelong believer in Western medicine. My mother never met a pill she didn't like in her quest to combat her many aches and pains. This is literally the next sentence after he says that she got breast cancer. I accompanied my mother to her consultation during which she was told she would need a double mastectomy. I developed a deeper level of concern for her right there in that room. Yeah, I would hope so. They're going to cut both her boobs off. <laughs> 
he like presents these emotions like he's the first person who's ever been like my mom is about to undergo major surgery i for one am concerned <laughs> Then he goes on this long rant about this movie, Prelude for a Kiss. He started with Mary Louise Parker on the stage, and they loved it. And then they tried to make it into a movie. And I guess the... Okay, I could not tell what the premise of this movie was, but it sounds like a man's wife and an old man switch bodies. <laughs> like, they freaky Friday, and he falls in love with the old man, and it ends with them kissing. And then they try to make it into a movie. Mary Louise Parker drops out. Meg Ryan's in an instant. No, they replace her because they don't think Mary Louise Parker is a big enough name. And he is like, this movie tanked because it wasn't with Mary Louise Parker. He has a reason for everything. Like, everything that has never gone exactly right, he has such a distinct, like, well, here's how we diagnose that problem. And the reason this movie sucked is because they wouldn't hire Mary Louise. I will give him credit, though. He's like, the studio tried to cut the kiss and make it just a hug. Because people <laughs> yeah. were so freaked out by me kissing an old man. The movie is called A Prelude to a Kiss. If there's no kiss then it's kind of a silly movie. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm with you, buddy. And then he's in Glengarry Glen Ross. And then he does the, A Streetcar Named Desire, and he's very nervous to film Marlon Brando's shoes. And someone says to him, it must be great to get all that anger out of your system every night. But my response was, I don't have that much anger in me. Indeed, some nights I wanted to ad lib a scene with Blanche in which we sat down, had a beer, and talked out our differences, ending up as good friends. Well, that's a bad play. To say instead of fucking the Marlon Brando like on your knees screaming, you want to just be like, hey, man, let's settle our differences over a cold beer. <laughs> I can't tell if people thought he was good in it or not. He won't say what the reviews were. He says they were mixed for everybody, but specifically bad for Jessica Lange, who he's like she went on to redeem herself, though. She really worked at it and she got way better. So all this time him and Kimmy B are together. He like can't stand her, though. This whole book is about how much she was the worst. And <laughs> although I don't know her and I wouldn't go to bat saying she's the best. It's very much like, you don't understand. I was an angel and she was a monster. Our friend Billy Princell, who's a very funny comedian, has this joke he does where whenever someone's telling you about a fight they had, their friend who they fought with is always the most psycho insane. Like, you awful, horrible bitch, I'll punch you. And all I said to them was, hello, dear roommate friend of mine. <laughs> I had but a simple request <laughs> that you put the cap back on the Brita pitcher. I find that when I come home, I'm simply parched. <laughs> and all I want is to be able to quench my thirst. And you chucked the Brita filter at my head. <laughs> And that's this whole book. Like, Kimmy B is just the most awful, hate, <laughs> despicable, horrible person. And Alec, poor Alec was just doing what he could to be her white knight and save her. And But he could only protect her from so much because she was so difficult. So at this point, Kim's age, she's 38, had seemed to let some of the air out of her tires. I, on the other hand, needed a break from the sweepstakes mentality of Hollywood. And I went to New York knowing that I needed a break from her and her self-absorption as well. Kim could be funny. She could be a mess. But most of all, Kim was about Kim. I needed to heal. And she wasn't built to comfort her significant other. Kim lived to be understood, not to understand. To heal, I needed a meaningful experience, a mountain to climb. So Tennessee Williams would help me by providing with me with one of the greatest challenges of all. Keep in mind, this is the man who, in his 50s, needed to be reminded by his wife that she exists. <laughs> but yes, Kim Basinger was the most self-absorbed person in that couple. So then Kim gets her ass fucking sued straight to hell. A production that she dropped out of sues her for delayed production or something like that. It turns into this mega lawsuit. And he says that someone else had dropped out of the movie and... It really wasn't going to fuck him over that bad, but they decided to make an example out of her. And I do believe that. I do believe that if you're trying to recoup losses on a movie that just keeps costing you money, you're going to pick a person who's already hated by the media and mm -hmm. the public. And so he talks about watching her in this courtroom to try and effectively represent herself as the victim in any and all disputes, which is what Kim was used to most of all. I mean, he like keeps on going back and forth between like, no, they really made an example out of her and this was unfair. But like also, she's a huge bitch. The whole lawsuit ends... She is sued for $8.9 billion. And something like that actually happened during the lawsuit. I think this would only be interesting if you lived through this lawsuit. But for those people, I will let you know what happened. So he says what actually happened is they sued her for $8.9 million. But at one point, she became the sole defendant on the entire case. The lawsuit was initially against her, her agents, her lawyers, her agency, a huge conglomerate of people. At some point in the case, everyone but her was dropped from the lawsuit. So it became just the producers suing Kim personally but for whatever reason the judge determined that the jury could not know that so the jury was not allowed to know that they were only suing the single individual of kim so kim then was sued for 8.9 million dollars and had to file for bankruptcy because she loses the case yeah and she can't afford that so she files for bankruptcy and then she's made an example of of people like falsely filing for bankruptcy to get out of like legal situations but the thing is a couple months later the actual case is overturned because they claim that what the judge 
did to her wasn't fair. And also it seems like the judge was friends with the defendants. Like she went over and hugged them after they won their case. So the whole case was thrown out. So she was unfairly accused. But there was like this whole hit piece written about her in the New York Times about how she was living this lavish life in mansions and jet setting all over the world and claiming to be bankrupt so she didn't have to pay off what she owed. Yeah. And so then he's like basically the whole situation ruined her, even though she ended up not fully like she lost, even though she didn't lose. And then he proposes and he goes, choosing to propose directly on the heels of the court case was in hindsight bad timing. I mean, yeah. She didn't say yes. She didn't say no. She was, to say the least, overwhelmed by all the turns her life had taken. My tendency to want to fix everything and my belief that I can got the better of me. Was this poor kid from Massapequa now prepared to make someone else's troubles disappear by supplying the necessary funding? Was I confusing pity with love? Nevertheless, we were married in August of that year. Okay. I'm sorry. What tendency that you want to fix everything? He's always talking about how he's like a fixer, how he's like there for people. And it's just like, what if you could list the things that you've fixed? Are they in the room with us right now? <laughs> <laughs> he just like makes up patterns and then a week later is like, never One mind. thing I've noticed most about my life is that I'm actually blue. <laughs> <laughs> everything is like we were the poorest kids in town and everything sucked and we had nowhere to be, but we had to play outside in the cold and in the rain and in the snow and it was brutal and that's why I'm fucked up. And then at the end of the book, he's like, man, when I was a kid, all we ever did was go outside and those were the glory days and now kids do nothing but get loved by their parents and it's sick. <laughs> You're like, what is it? <laughs> After that New York Times hit piece comes out, he goes, I spent the morning screaming at Kim's lawyers about how I wanted to kill the Times reporter, perhaps also sensing that all of this wasn't very good for me either. I remember like a couple pages ago when he goes, I don't really have any anger in me. Also, I love that he's completely leaving out his own relationship to the press at this point. He's really pretending in this book that all of the bad press is because he happens to be associated with this dumb evil bitch, Kimmy B. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's not until the last chapter of this book. He's like, listen, in the 80s, I punched four different paparazzi. <laughs> I'm like, were they writing about that or no? Was that coming up in the papers or was it just the Kim and her drama? He punched him again. Punch. <laughs> He's playing like whack-a-mole with paparazzi. So then they have a baby. They had kind of discussed not having a baby. And he was like, Kim never really wanted a baby. And I just accepted that as my fate, even though I would see little babies playing at the airport and think, oh, has fatherhood passed me by? <laughs> and it's like, oh, man, if I could go back and tell... 35 year old Alec Baldwin one thing it would be it has not (laughs) trust me sir love these first 45 child free years and I'm counting the ones where Ireland existed those are still (laughs) child free years it is so funny that in this whole book he's like six kids was too much why did my flabby mom have six kids my dad couldn't afford him my mom couldn't raise him later he makes him say he's like even though my sister was miserable being one of six, she went on and replicated the same mistakes. Six kids. Those kids are mistakes to Alec Baldwin. I'm <laughs> like, buddy, you're going to top them all. You're about to have 100 kids. <laughs> At 100 years of life, he's going to have 100 kids. They're trying to do a kid per year. It's a race against the clock, but the math is there if they keep it tight enough. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, so Ireland is born, and he's sad because after Ireland was born, all the love Kim had went to her child. And every moment we were together after that, the emptiness that resulted moved us towards the inevitable. So once again, Kim's fault. Kim's a dumb bitch. God, (laughs) if there's one thing dumb bitches do, it's love Love their their children. (laughs) (laughs) One of the meanest things we've ever seen a wife do from the perspective of a male memoirist is like, prioritize a newborn's existence (laughs) how fucking dare they we're always being told to watch like men compete with other men but there is no one an adult man is more competitive with than his own (laughs) newborn kin (laughs) you think he's hotter than me (laughs) he's tiny like harrison ford (laughs) should i read these sentences we're at another chapter called of course of course which is like what is he talking about? I don't know. I've been reading all the chapter titles as we go this time, which I, I don't think I did when I read the book, and none of them make any sense. But he literally starts it with, the list of men I admire in movies is quite long. And then he just lists men. My favorite <sighs> movie actor is William Holden. On screen, Holden is handsome, graceful, charming, and funny. He is tough and resourceful enough to handle himself in any type of predicament. He's an actor, sir. <laughs> when you see him fighting in movies, he's not literally being resourceful. <laughs> he came up with that. They were like, hey, what if you get what if you get run over? And he goes, what if I fight back? He really doesn't understand acting. He's talking about how jealousy is that back in the day, people used to write characters for actors. He goes, the scripts were tailored for him. Writers today, in most cases, don't necessarily write for one particular actor. Yeah, they're writing a script, and then you as an actor are supposed to embody the character. But what I wouldn't give to have been born in 1925 or so, to have survived the war and gone on to a career in films in that golden age of the 1940s and 50s. Do you think Alec Baldwin, so desperate to have gone to a war, has started a war in the streets? Yes. (laughs) Every day, 
on the streets of New York City is his Iraq. Okay, so then he talks about how in his career he's played some mean characters. He says in movies like Malice and the Jur, I played negative value in the script, which means bad guys. And he goes, it was hard for me after that to get a role as a good guy because executives are so narrow-minded that once they've seen you be a bad guy, they can't even believe you could be a good guy. And it's like, I think that you might just not be good at acting. It's so funny how many times he's like, even though I have a perfect soul, (laughs) I was playing a douchebag. How? And nobody could see me as anything else. He says this line, which I love because he's such, he's a real elitist. He is a real culture snob. Hopkins has numerous gifts, and it is, of course, his voice that casts his spell. Like the French horn solo from Tchaikovsky's Fifth, he simply opens his mouth to speak, and his work is halfway done. Later in the book, he gives you a list of symphonies that you could consume if you're someone who appreciates culture. I'm just like, I get it. I, uh, you really think you're better than everybody. So then he is talking about how he, he gets slapped with a little bit of a fine for delaying a film. And he's like, how fucking dare they? I told them that I was busy that day. Everybody's against him. So you don't understand the problem with Al Baldwin is nobody wanted him in any movie. Somehow he seems to have been in TV shows from the day he accepted his job as the receptionist at the New York Athletic Club. But even though it seems like he's never been prepared for any role and people just wanted to cast him anyway, the whole world is also against him. It's a weird dichotomy that is the truth of Alec Baldwin's life. Yeah, so now he's working on this shit project where they were mad at him and he goes, I was now stuck in the middle of Alberta, my wife and young child at home in LA with a director who had no business making the film and a producer who was content to watch the studio fuck with me as some kind of payback for my desire to bring the same crew I'd taken on the road with me for years. So basically because he's traveling with an entourage, he thinks they hate him. They still hired him. He's still in this fucking movie. So the movie was called The Edge, and I think it just didn't do that well. A lot of movies he was in didn't do that well because of something other than himself. You know what's weird is he barely mentions Beetlejuice. And I'm like, I think that did really well. I mean, later in the, this book, he does just like a list of movies. Oh, I mean, we're getting to that chapter. So then in this next chapter, he just gives a list of other movies that he's made. But not first without explaining how much better he is than everybody and how unfair life has been to him. After The Edge, I grew tired of the limitations of studio movie making and just in time as that system had grown tired of me as well. You have to sell tickets. There are actors who are drug addled, fornicating madmen. There are bullies who not only lack talent but also create some degree of difficulty wherever they work. There are actresses whose vanity and lack of self-awareness are so dense you could split the atoms of their egos in a fuel reactor. Their behavior makes little difference as long as their movies make money. On the other hand, you could be professional, committed, appropriately curious, hardworking, and collegial. But if your movie tank you're out (laughs) poor poor professional committed appropriately curious hardworking, collegial alec baldwin he just cannot catch a break he says like when you're hanks or will smith you're the powerful engine and expensive machine everyone is just going to keep functioning around you but if you're not one of those guys you have to work harder and then he just goes on with like a list of movies he's been in where he wasn't the star, but he still learned something. He acts like this is his indie era. He's like, I just ate it and decided I'd have to take lower paying roles for more interesting work. And then the list is like, for example, (laughs) I was in Thomas the Magic Railroad and the cat in the hat. (laughs) He goes, the cat in the hat, 2003. (laughs) The film was disappointing in several ways, but it was nice to shoot on a lot for a change and watch them spend a gagillion dollars on costumes, sets, and all things Susian. Well, my favorite is he talks about getting offered the role in It's Complicated with Meryl Streep, which he initially turned down because they're supposed to be exes, and he is nine years younger than Meryl Streep. And he did not think that that would be realistic, that they would be together. And then Nancy Myers is like, well, men play older than their wives all the time on films. Why can't we do the reverse? And he's like, oh, that's such a good point. And to you, Alec Baldwin, if you're listening, I say, never once in my life, and I have watched It's Complicated upwards of 4,000 times, did I ever look at you and Meryl Streep on the screen and say, they're mismatched, they're ages are preposterous never once today for a second even think that she could possibly be one day older than you you know where i have noticed an age gap in a relationship with you and your actual wife the woman that you've married who i thought well that could be his child (laughs) why would they be together that's crazy but you and meryl that felt reasonable to me so i'm glad that even though you were so desperate for work you almost passed up the time to work opposite meryl fucking street because you were like well i would never fuck her she's a hag (laughs) nobody will believe this piece of shit movie (laughs) try acting alec (laughs) So the reason that none of these movies really stick out to him, aside from being non-starring roles, is that he was at this time fighting for custody of Ireland. So he and Kim had broken up. They were in an absolute war over custody, and he was having a hard time. Something interesting about Kimmy B is that when they were together and he was defending her, the whole world was against her and she couldn't win anything. And then when it's her against him, 
suddenly she's the most powerful one in the world and she just cannot lose and everybody's on her side and he he is the victim yeah he blames losing on rapacious lawyers and cowardly judges i'm overwhelmed by a great loss of faith i wrote a book about my divorce called a promise to ourselves which was the creed de cour of a father who is alienated not only by his ex but also the divorce industrial complex including the courts themselves which is, it's crazy. He did not win custody of Ireland because he describes what he was like as a father. And he sounds amazing. He says, <laughs> I would visit her every other week for a day and we'd make a bed out of every blanket we could find and put the pillows against the dresser. And then we'd watch her favorite TV shows, The Fairly Odd Parents or Powerpuff Girls. Not a lot was said, but we just sat there, ate snacks and watched TV. Before long, Kim would come back and take Ireland. How are you going to fight with a perfect dad? What, you mean there's more to fatherhood than letting a child watch TV and giving him popcorn? If the goal of my ex and her lawyers was to damage or ruin my relationship with my daughter, then I certainly gave them the ammunition to do that. So then, obviously, we know in 2007, the infamous voicemail leaks. So this is a voicemail where he calls his daughter a spoiled pig, and he's screaming at her. A man who has no anger in his heart somehow found it in him to scream at his daughter on a voicemail. <laughs> And he writes about this. Okay. He feels betrayed by the entertainment industry for revealing this information. He's like, even though I was quote unquote part of the NBC family, they still put it on NBC. <laughs> and also the damage done to his reputation didn't just hurt his relationship with his daughter. It hurt his relationship with Barack Obama. <laughs> he saw Barack Obama one time in the lobby of his Central Park West apartment just as I was leaving. He was no doubt headed to a meet potential Democratic supporters. And he would have been one. But back then, I couldn't imagine how he or anyone else would want my support, so I stopped offering it. I've often regretted any lost opportunities during Obama's year in the White House, the chance to work with his administration on behalf of the arts or children or the environment. <laughs> I simply felt that my family life and reputation were in tatters. That is so many different categories of ways that you assumed you would have been in the White House. <laughs> the arts or children or the environment. That's a lot of things. It's like, I can't believe that me screaming at my daughter and just completely baffled over how I couldn't regain custody of her led to me not being able to hang out with Barack Obama. I think it's just a loss for our country personally. Me too. It sucks that that dumb bitch Kimmy B sabotaged him with his own actions in a way <laughs> that prevented us, the American people, from having him team up with Barack to protect the environment. <laughs> we would not be in the predicament we are today with either the arts, nor the children, nor the environment if Alec Baldwin had been allowed to fulfill his potential. And for that, we can only hate the least hot co-star of the worst Batman movie. <laughs> then Lauren Michaels comes a knock in. So he get, he's gotten to know Lauren over the few past few years because Alec Baldwin hosted SNL a bunch of times. So he knows Lauren because of SNL. And then Lauren calls and is like, I have a job for you. Lauren is producing a show for someone called Tina Fey that he thinks Jack Baldwin, Jack Baldwin, that he thinks Alec Baldwin would be perfect for. He had kind of tested his comedy chops by hosting SNL. And he was like, I'm not, this is the second thing I respect. The two things I respect about Alec Baldwin are one, him saying I brought fame upon myself and like the lack of privacy that mm -hmm. I have in my life is something that I did. And number two, him saying, I am not funny. Writers are funny. I can read lines. <laughs> I'm like, that's true. I mean, he doesn't really talk that much about 30 Rock other than it was a really fun thing to be a part of. He won awards. When it ended, it felt like high school, man. He was finally sad for the first time. And I was like, yeah, because it's fun. He also has like a weird little line in the middle where he goes, over the years, I bitched and moaned as only actors can about being tied to a contract for a show that would never be my own. Were you cunty about being on 30 Rock? So then it's 2012. 30 Rock is over. He has this friend that he chats with on the phone. And like every person ever, he was like, should this be a podcast? <laughs> well, he thinks it should be a radio show. And they're like, no, it shouldn't be. Just make a podcast. And he was like, oh, I have my own podcast radio. <laughs> podcast radio by Alec Baldwin. He has all these ideas that don't go anywhere. But for some reason, he has to share them with you. One of his great ideas was bring on a young guy we'd call the kid. I love that. I love when you come up with a nickname for someone before you find the person. That's always good, authentic stuff. <laughs> we'd give him a credit card and some cash, then turn him loose on Manhattan nightlife. The object was for the kid to spend the night doing everything that Lisa and I were too old to do. Openings, exhibits, theaters, galleries, movies, parties, clubs, clubs, clubs. I batted this idea around with a couple of friends who, as I remember it, looked at me and said, why do you want to do radio? <laughs> Which means that it was a bad idea. So he starts this podcast. He's interviewing famous people. He goes, right away, I liked doing the show. People ask me why I do it. And the answer is that it's storytelling in its own right. I want to tell their stories. Peter Frampton, Herb Alpert, Rosie O'Donnell, George Stephanopoulos. If during our talk, my own experiences overlapped with theirs, so be it. <laughs> 
I wanted to interview people the way I wanted to be interviewed. So basically, he's like, I wanted an opportunity to talk more, and I had to do it through George Stephanopoulos, who's never gotten an opportunity to share his story. He says, we recorded nearly all of our guests for an hour, sometimes longer. No one is interested in my guests more than I am. I am openly a fan. This, to me, reads like someone who has been accused of not being interested in their guests. I don't know why that sentence exists other than to be like, someone once said I wasn't interested in my guests and that's not true. Everything in this book is like people say these things about me, but they're not true because I don't think they are. So then he really wants a TV show because obviously, and he thinks he should get to do like the late show or something. He should, he thinks he should get to do Conan's job, but instead they give him a show on MSNBC. And I think he thinks he's going to do the news and they suggest he gets a Kathy Griffin type as his co-host. And he's like, why would I do that? This is serious news. And it's like, why? What do you know about anything, Alec? And then his show gets canceled after five episodes. And he's really upset that he's not given an opportunity to, like, find his voice. And he goes, Ronan Farrow got a chance to find his voice, even though his show only got, like, five viewers. His ratings plummeted to 11,000 viewers among the desired demographic. My show, entitled Up Late with Alec Baldwin, pulled in low ratings in the demo as well. But our numbers were more than 10 times Farrow's, who was given a year to develop on air. My show was dropped after five episodes. If the ratings were all of it, I'd understand. But they weren't. So then you find out the reason his show was canceled is because he, like, kept punching paparazzi and calling them slurs. He screamed a homophobic thing at a paparazzi who was cheating him. He calls him a cock-sucking F-word. He later tries to go on the air and say, no, I said fathead. <laughs> he insists that he said fathead. He goes, I didn't say that word. And he goes, but do I say it all the time to my gay friends? And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> okay. So that's why it got canceled. They could not prove that I said the offending word. The reason they couldn't prove it is because I didn't say it. It literally, they have it on video. It's on video. You just have to Google it. It's just an interesting defense to be like, I didn't say that, but would I totally? <laughs> and then he goes on and on to be like, I'm very involved in progressive politics. So shut up. Yeah. He later at the end of the book, related or unrelated is like, listen, there's been a lot of men that I've been in love with. And maybe if I had grown up at a different time, I would have tested those waters. <laughs> And I'm like, Alec, write the memoir you want to write. And then he talks about how, like, the media has always conspired against him and always trying to ruin him. And he says in one of the most interesting responses I've ever seen, <laughs> he wishes that he could be better like Woody Allen. He talks about Woody Allen. He goes, Allen responds with an aplomb I only wish I had. I cannot imagine that your scandal king would be Woody Allen. So then he goes on to talk about politics, a great segue. And he says, if I ran for president of the United States, you'd be lucky. Just as if you ran for the president of the United States, I would be lucky. I don't think that any of that's true. I don't think that any of that's true. He talks a lot about his own political involvement and political aspirations. So he says that, once again, I told you we'd come back to this. After my unsuccessful run for class president at George Washington, I started to become more jaded. The election opened my eyes to the kinds of people who envisioned themselves in leadership roles. When I'd arrived for freshman orientation at GW, I unpacked my bags in a six-man suite where four of my five roommates had already declared themselves political science majors, and two of those four stated that they were planning to run for president of the United States one day. So basically, he's like, listen, when I was in college, I realized that politicians were fucking idiots. That's why they wouldn't let me be president of the college and I had to become an actor instead. He also later says that in 1997, New York Magazine put me on the cover with the title C. Alec Run. The mostly positive piece teased my aspirations to some state political office, but my allergy to campaign fundraising told me I wasn't ready. To run for office meant I would have to give up the work I loved on the stage and screen to play a part I didn't want to play, a politician raising money. Alec, please do not run. You're not gonna win. It can't be you. It'll probably be Matthew McConaughey. So he talks about how he worked heavily with the Clintons and how he likes them and how even if Bill Clinton did, if the Monica Lewinsky, he goes, if that is true, that whole Monica Lewinsky thing, I still think Bill Clinton's a good guy. He goes, he shouldn't have dealt with all that drama. It was too much drama that the Republicans forced him to reconcile with. And then he goes on to talk about how George W. Bush sucks because the Iraq war is bad. And he says that a lot of Americans don't know that the Iraq war was bad because we don't think about other countries very often, which honestly, oh. that might be true. That might be true. <laughs> and then he says, I became complacent when Obama won, which is more a sign of, I mean, okay. So basically he thinks that, that Trump won because Alec Baldwin became complacent when Obama got into the office. I mean, he's like literally in the same way that he doesn't remember Hil Hillary exists when he's not with her. Hilaria, Hill, Hill Baldwin. He, like, thinks that politics cease to function properly when he's not involved. He's like, listen, democracy was running perfectly smoothly, like a fine, a well-tuned machine 
but then when I took my foot off the gas, all of a sudden things crumbled. Coincidence? I think not. Our guy was in, so we were covered. Politics was also boring the hell out of me. He says he like could never have expected Hillary to lose. He goes, I could go on in another book. Perhaps I might go into greater detail about what the president of the United States ought to do and who that person ought to be. Please, Alec Baldwin, please write a book about who should be what characteristics the president of the United States should possess. We're waiting for you to fix democracy. My theory is that he would write that book and then in the proofread be like, holy shit, it's me. <laughs> but like as if it had never dawned on him before that he didn't realize while writing 300 pages that he was describing himself. He's like, we need a man who can act and smolder and has a hot young wife and a million children and maybe somebody who's not afraid to punch a paparazzi and you know <laughs> somebody who who is so important that if they took their foot off the gas for a second donald trump will get elected he finally he talks a little bit about how he actually considered running for the governor of new york or the mayor you know i don't know the difference between mayors and governors it really confuses me Anyway, at one point they approached him to run, and this was actually when Hillary was pregnant with their first child. And so he says he didn't run because his wife was expecting. And this leads me to a theory that Hill Baldwin might actually be continuing to get pregnant so that Alec does not have time to run for office. I think she might be on the front lines. She <laughs> might be our strongest soldier. <laughs> Gracias, Hilaria. <laughs> So then he concludes this whole book with the final chapter, you know, was I truly happy? Have I ever been happy? And then you'll never believe it. But it turns out when he looks back at his life, the only time he was really happy was when he was a kid just fucking cutting grass and eating fried rice out of a container on a parking lot with his brother, Stephen. I'm like, mm, that driftwood childhood of yours that you said you hated so fucking much. It turns out that was the only time you were happy. Interesting. And then he talks about the things he's accomplished. He says he has a radio podcast. And then he says the custody battle was hard, but then he found the light at the end of the tunnel and that is hilaria baldwin who it does seem like he very much loves i just say i've heard a lot of people describe their spouses and a lot of them give me pause yeah i do think he absolutely is obsessed with hilaria me too as he should be i as mean he, what's not to be obsessed with have you seen that bitch do squats and heels with a baby in her arms incredible work and he is looking back at his mom she has now dedicated her life to breast cancer research and she has her own fund he says over the years we began to joke about how my mother has become a bigger celebrity than any of her sons we joked that she'd push any of us off a cliff for a photo op now that she was the celebrity um that's funny i'm sure she appreciates that and she but he also goes i am close to shedding a tear as i write this my dad never could have done all that he did if it wasn't for my mother. Ugh. Never. I know. None of her children could have achieved what they wanted to achieve without her contribution as well. All men want some degree of accomplishment. Women do too. So he finds out that women have wants and needs and sometimes men don't let them do their, their needs. Or even that it turns out, did you know that raising six children can be just as much work as being a high school teacher? <laughs> <sighs> Not by my count. <laughs> Not by his until recently. It feels like it's harder than ever to survive in the entertainment business. God knows I've made many mistakes in my career. Nevertheless, I have more work than I can handle. I made my fair share of mistakes raising my daughter, Ireland. Nevertheless, I love Ireland with all my soul, and I believe that she knows that, and she loves me too. Waiting to hear back from Ireland. <laughs> Ireland declined to comment. I mean, that is one of my questions, this whole thing about how he's so obsessed with Ireland and He's like, every two weeks, I would get on a flight just to go pick her up for my one weekend. I was allotted every other week. And I'm like, why didn't you just live in L.A., dude? And finally, I have neither the time nor the talent to write a book. True. Nevertheless, <laughs> I wrote this book in my own words. And such as it is, I offer it to you to entertain, to motivate, to inspire, and to learn. Not so much for you to learn about me, but for me to learn about me. <laughs> okay. I can't believe I just had to sit through Alec Baldwin class. <laughs> I have learned so much while piecing this together. My thanks to you for reading it. Um, You're fucking welcome. Because it was... a drag this was not easy ashley yeah final thoughts on alec baldwin bad guy okay my final thought is tough stuff props to hilary yeah for putting up with it he really thinks highly of himself yeah he has no doubt which is an interesting way to go through life <laughs> <laughs> um you guys first of all happy holidays i hope everybody is warm and toasty and safe with somebody they love i hope everyone had just like simply the merriest Christmas there ever was the happiest Hanukkah anything you're doing to get through these cold months I hope that you're surrounded by love I'm excited for the new year with you guys and also this week on the Patreon we will be doing a Patreon we're doing a fact like a frequently asked questions oh yeah so if you're a newer listener an older listener and there's something that we're always referring to that you're just like what the fuck are they talking about they keep like if we have any staple or tent pole or column that is holding up this entire podcast that you're like they've never clarified what they're <laughs> talking about this is your chance to ask if you have any podcast questions 
producing, creating tech. Claire and Ashley questions. If you want to know how tall we are, if you want to know yeah. what our prefs are, I'm let us eight. know. We love you guys so much. <laughs> and I'm so excited to meet you in the new year. And also, yeah, hope I, hopefully I meet you guys on tour this year. I love oh you. Oh, my God. I cannot wait. And I would like to give a heartiest thank you to Inappropriate Tattoo. It seems appropriate to me to buy. Um, how about hi? I'm happy to have you here. To Taylor's Ghostwriter, baby. I'll pay you a lot of money to tell me her secrets. Andy MF, I love that motherfucker. To Vero Molevi, I appreciate you very much. To uh, VNI Callet 14, I hope to serenade you with some Colby Callet someday. To Nastia Big Gun, oh baby, I'm pretty impressed by those guns. Thank you to, and I mean muscles, not actual guns. I don't support that. Um, to underlying sweetness. Oh my God, I see your sweetness right up top. Thank you, Kylie Inda. Um, I'm so happy to have this review, Inda Bank. Thank you to Kate Z. I appreciate you from A to Z. Thank you to Ken Hizzle. Um, I appreciate this for shizzle. Thank you, ACM. 427. I appreciate this 24 7. Thank you to Sierra MT. You are my favorite t shirt wearer. Thank you to J Maze 18. I would get lost in a corn maze forever with you. Thank you to Wombat Forever. Oh my God, do I root for the Wombats? Thank you guys so much. I love you. See you next year, Sailor.